Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Forestry Adaptation Practitioners Network webinar titled A Regional Integrated Assessment of the Impacts of Climate Change on Quebec's Forests. What have we learned? My name is Suzanne Sealing, and I'm the Community Manager of the online Forestry Adaptation Practitioners Network. For those of you who aren't familiar, the FAPN for short, is an online community for climate change adaptation in the forestry sector. It provides a space where researchers, experts, and practitioners can come together to communicate and share resources with others who are also working in this field. Um, it includes features like news articles, different resources, um, an events calendar, and so much more. It's also free to join. Uh, I'll post a link to the network in the chat box. You're welcome to click on it for more information and also to register. I'll also post a link to our FAPN member survey. We're currently in the process of writing a strategic plan and your input is really important. It's going to help us make improvements and just identify whether uh, the network is uh, valuable and, and providing benefit to you. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. If at any time during the webinar you have questions or experience technical difficulties, click on the chat box, find my name in the drop down menu, and send me a private direct message. We encourage you to use the chat box to enter your questions uh, throughout the presentation, but do know that we will hold them until the dedicated Q&A period after uh, Jan's presentation. I'll mention we are recording the webinar today. I will be sending out a copy of the, the webinar recording and also um, a, a copy of the presentation slides. With that being said, we're very excited to have Jan Boulanger here with us today to talk about Quebec's regional integrated assessment of the impacts of climate change on the province's forests. And just so you know a little bit more about your presenter, Jan holds a PhD in biology from the University from the Université du Québec at Rimouski. We should be calling you Dr. Boulanger then. Uh, between 2010 and 2013, he was a postdoctoral fellow under the supervision of Dr. Sylvie Gauthier and Phil Burton at the Laurentian Forestry Center, where he worked to define homogeneous fire regimes zones in Canada. Since then, he's been a researcher in forest ecology. His research interests include the projection of natural disturbance regimes in Canada, mainly fire and spruce budworm in relation to climate change, the projection of forest landscapes and wildlife habitats, and the dynamics of spruce budworm dispersal using weather radar. Dr. Boulanger is an associate professor at the Université du Québec at Rimouski, at Laval University, and at the Université du Québec on Abiti Témiscamingue. So on behalf of everyone joining us today, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our presenter and thank you for taking the time to present today. Without further ado, I will now turn things over to you, Jan. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Susan. And thanks a lot for the invitation. That's really, uh, I'm really glad to be here today to present you a, a project that we have conducted over the, the Quebec province. Uh, it's, a, it's a project that we have finished uh, two years ago, and now we are able to uh, to present you the, the different results that could be applied to, to some extent to other provinces that are within the, the eastern boreal forest or anywhere else in the, uh, in, the in the boreal forest, uh, I guess. So I, I would like to first to acknowledge all the, the people that have has work on the on this project. So we have people from very different backgrounds, either practitioners or scientists or um, uh, academic, also from different uh, departments within the federal or the province, um, or within also uh, different different universities. So it's it's not a secret for for anyone that the Earth is warming and it's warming pretty fast. We know that. 2023 was the warmest year on record, and by a huge margin, actually, according to uh, to different records that we have since the, the late 1800s, uh, we know that we were very, very close to the uh, one plus 1 1.5 degrees Celsius anomaly uh, relative to the pre-industrial era. Uh, we are on a, a upward trend, of course, 
and probably 2024 will be as warm or maybe warmer than 2023. And in Canada, uh, of course, this warming is occurring uh, much faster than on the global scale. We know that since 1940, well, 1948, the temperature has risen by 1.7 degree, uh, which is twice the rate uh, of the rest of the globe. Uh, so that's that's a lot. And we, we can see that the warming is not, uh, well, if we are going northward, westward, uh, the, the warming is, uh, is higher, is much more severe, but still there is a warming all across the country and all across the different season. If we are looking into the future, we can well expect what what will happen in the in the next uh, in the next decade. So since the uh, well uh, uh, at, at the at the end of the of the current century, so there are different scenarios that were uh, developed over the years to uh, to predict uh, how warm will be uh, or warmer will be the the the, the globe at the end of the of the twenty first century. And these scenarios can be summarized as the well. Uh, the, the latest one, um, the previous one, were the RCP scenarios. Maybe you're familiar with them. So it's the representative concentration pathways. These were changed to the SSP scenario, so the shared socioeconomic pathways for in the, the latest uh, IPCC report. And according to these different scenarios, we could see a warming of the planet between 1.4 and 4.7 degrees Celsius, depending on the scenarios. According to the current policies that we have globally, we could see an increase of about 2.6 or 2.7 degrees Celsius, which is pretty close to the SSP 24.5 scenario. Uh, if we are able to uh, reach our 2030 commitment, we'll still be warming by 2.4 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. But if we are, uh, we are reaching those commitments, and we are reaching also net zero promises by 2050. We could uh, the Earth would would warm by 1.8 degrees Celsius, but it's still quite a lot. And as as I mentioned just before, this is for on a global scale. We have to see on a local or regional scale at the scale of Canada, in this case for for Quebec, uh, how this would translate into uh, different temperatures or different precipitation, for for example. And you have here the, uh, the, the RCP 4.5 scenario in blue and the RCP 8.5, uh, which is a, uh, a high end uh, scenario. And we can see what could be the warming by the end of the century, according to these different scenarios. And under RCP 4.5, we could warm temperature in Quebec by four, well, between three to five degrees Celsius. Uh, and under RCP 8.5, we're talking about six, seven, or even eight degrees Celsius more than uh, the, well, relative to, uh, to, to 2000. And you can see that actually the, the precipitations are not increasing a lot during those, um, those years. So if it's, uh, if the precipitations are not increasing <clears throat> or just a bit and temperature are increasing a lot, we could be living in a in a climate that will be much drier in the future. So if we are in a warmer planet or a, uh, or a drier planet, of course, the, there are a lot of consequences on on forests on forest landscapes. Uh, these are already happening in the in the Canadian forest, uh, and they will be much more severe into the future. So we can talk about uh, mountain pine beetle outbreaks, for example, that are driven at some point by climate change, spruce bottom outbreak, drought, aspen dieback, fire, of course. Uh, so you we heard about last year fires, for example, growth declines also in for some species that are affected by uh, by climate change. And of course, uh, within this framework, uh, there are impacts of, of climate change, but we can also ask to ourselves to which point harvesting strategies will be themselves affected by, by climate change and how they will in uh, harvesting will, will also interact with the climate change impact. So can we adapt? Can we resist to some point to, to climate change? Can we be resilient also to climate change? That's These are questions that we are 
uh, asking to ourselves. And these are very important for the forest sector. Because, you know, all of these uh, impacts, they are accumulating uh, among each other. They are interacting also among each other. So we, we have to, it's, it's not, uh, we, we cannot just analyze stuff separately. We have to analyze them in a, in a way that we know how those disturbances will disturbances will interact and will uh, accumulate to to see what will be the, the end result uh, at, at the end of the of the uh, of the century. And as uh, as I mentioned before, uh, those impacts will be very harsh or very severe for some. Um, so some forest uh, for, for the forestry sector actually, and they are pot potentially manifold. So the impacts will be great on the on the, the harvesting side of things, but also on the conservation side of things, on the social side of things, uh, for conservation, uh, biodiversity, carbon. So uh, we have to to look to all of these um, impacts to have a holistic view of what could be the impact of climate change on the on the forest sector. And of course, uh, climate change and adaptation requires significant foundational science and is often implemented at the local and regional scale. Since the regions are different in different forest types, climate change impacts and risk uh, and sector issues and concerns are and capacity also to, to respond uh, are very different from a region to another. Uh, the actors are different. The, the vulnerabilities are different. The way that we can adapt to those vulnerabilities are also different. So that's pretty much why we have to integrate uh, very different expertise and perspective uh, at the regional scale to, to have much better decisions and, strategic, uh, and strategies to adapt or to mitigate climate change uh, for, the forest, uh, for the forest sector. So this is the framework that we adopted to, to uh, analyze uh, what we call the regional integrated assessment of the climate change impact on Quebec forest. So first we, we aim to identify where are the vulnerabilities for the forest itself, then how those vulnerabilities translate into vulnerabilities in ecosystem goods and services. And then once we know that we can have uh, adaptation strategies that are specific to those vulnerabilities that were previously identified, and so this is the uh, the study area that we um, that we use. So you can see that it's it's pretty much all across the uh, the commercial forest of Quebec. Uh, within this uh, this study area, we had specific studies that were looking at very specific vulnerability vulnerabilities of the of the forest like vulnerabilities to to fire to change in biodiversity change in in, in carbon budget for example so uh, these are all integrated within the um, the regional analysis that we have conducted and um you, you can see also that well the Quebec province the, the Quebec uh, forest they are uh, pretty diverse, and this also drove at some point our analysis. Because for those who are not familiar with the Quebec uh, Quebec forest uh, in the southern part, we have the northern woods, then the the mixed wood forests, and then going up northward, and then we have the boreal uh, the boreal forest. And the results that I will be showing uh, after are somewhat summarized within those uh, different forest regions. And for those who are interested, we uh, we conducted uh, a lot of uh, webinars during uh, it's it's already three years old, but uh, I mean that's they're still relevant. Uh, these are uh, we have the recording on YouTube. Uh, we have also the PDFs of those uh, different uh, projects that were or webinar that were conducted uh, that are part of this uh, regional integrated assessment. Of course, they are in French. Uh, but I can I can sh uh, share you the uh, the links uh, within the, um, the the chat box uh, further uh, in the uh, further in the, the discussion. So first step so uh, of the framework that we adopted so identify the the forest vulnerabilities. So one of the of the of the vulnerabilities that we have identified of course was fire. Uh, fire is a very prominent. Uh, natural disturbances within, well, all across the Canadian provinces, within the, the boreal forests, and of course, within the Quebec boreal forest. Uh, 
uh, mostly. We have an area uh, that is actually at the northwestern part of the of the province, which is called the Eastern James Bay Homogeneous Fire Regime Zone, that is already uh, experiencing um, annual rear burn of about, well, uh, if we're counting last year fires, it's about 1% per year. But if we are uh, um, projecting ourselves into the future, since fire season will be longer, since uh, temperature and so that the fire weather indices will be much more severe and much more frequent, uh, this will have an impact on the number of fires and also the number of large fire and the and also the annual area burn. So by the end of the century, sorry, by the end of the century, some part of the Quebec province, depending on the climate scenario, so we have the RCP 2.6 and the RCP 8.5, uh, we could see an increase of two three, four, or even five-fold uh, increase in area burn relative to the uh, last 30 years in some area. So it means that fire cycle could be very, very short in some area. So of course, this will have an impact on the forest sector. Uh, the 2023 fire season, uh, well, you, you all probably experienced that that fire season last year is, is a, an image, I would say, of the uh, a, a great example of uh, the impact of climate change on fire. Uh, just to give you an example, last year, uh, about more than 15 million hectares burned. Uh, that's, that's almost seven times the annual average. Uh, that's twice the uh, the last uh, record that was uh, record actually in 1989. Uh, this was driven by spatially extensive, persistent and very severe uh, fire weather uh, parameters or indices. Uh, you have here a box plots uh, at the uh, at the right side of the of the slide that shows that. Um, so each dot actually represents a year uh, between 1950 and 2023, and uh, you have the values. I mean the the average value for the annual average value for different fire weather sub indices, I would say. And uh, the red dot is actually 2023. So you can see that this year was way above any other year because temperatures, precipitation, and all of the stuff were very, uh, they were causing very far prone conditions. And these conditions are expected to become much more frequent in the future. So fueling uh, literally the fires in the, in the future in Canada and also uh, including Quebec. Sorry. Uh, other disturbances that are affecting the, the, um, the Quebec forest, it's the spruce bottom outbreak. So uh, this map shows actually the potential severity of spruce bottom outbreak, uh, given the overlap of the climate suitability of the, of the species and also the host volume. So the host, uh, when I'm talking about host, it's balsam fir, black spruce, uh, white spruce, uh, but mostly balsam fir, of course. Uh, balsam fir is much more vulnerable to uh, to spruce bloodworm than than anything else. But you know, because of uh, climate, will become less. Uh, I mean, the climate envelope of the spruce bloodworm outbreak will shift northward. Uh, it won't actually overlap with host species anymore, or much less. So we could expect that by the end of the century, especially under very severe warming. Uh, uh, spruce bottom outbreaks could actually decrease in severity within the, um, the commercial forest. Of course, there are a lot of uncertainties about that, and it doesn't uh, consider the fact that some host species might become more vulnerable by the end of the century um, because of climate synchrony and stuff like that. So uh, it's really important to keep that in mind. Another impact of climate change, it's on productivity. So what do you have here? These are maps of potential productivity of the species, potential growth, actually, uh, of a different species within the, the commercial forest of Quebec. If it's green, it means that by the end of the century, under RCP 8.5, the, the growth of the species will be better than under the current climate. Uh, but if it's red, it's the opposite. So you can see that there's, there are a lot of species, especially boreal species, especially uh, late successional coniferous species like uh, black spruce, um, balsam fir, uh, stuff like that. So those, those uh, species will be 
very affected by uh, by climate warming or climate uh, and drying also uh, and um, and that will also affect how the forest will respond to uh, to climate change so actually we, we can uh classify the impact of climate change that I've just uh, presented earlier as the direct impact of climate change, which is the direct impact of the, on the physiology of the tree, like the growth that I've just shown here, and the indirect impact of climate change on natural disturbances, for example. And when we are putting everything together, we can see that what could be the cumulative and interactive impact of all of the stuff that I've just uh, talked about uh, on the species composition or the, the, the biomass that we will have within the, the forest. And there are different uh, statements that we can make uh, according to those uh, simulations that we have conducted with uh, all across the, the Quebec provinces. These are separate the, between the, the, the boreal mixed and northern outward um, biomes. And one of the, the first statement is, is to say that within uh, a climate that will be much warmer, like under RCP 8.5, everywhere we will see a decrease in, in biomass, but for different reasons. Uh, within the boreal forest, it's mostly because fire will become much more prevalent or prominent. Uh, if there's if there are more fires, it means that the landscape are much younger, so they are they have less uh, uh, they have less biomass. Uh, species composition is also different because of that. Some uh, species will be much more able to regenerate because they will be much more fire, like trembling aspen, for example, at the expense of other species that are not used to uh, to have a lot of fire, to see a lot of fires, like basam fir, for example. Uh, in the, the southern part of the, of the province, where fire is not that much prevalent, we could see a decrease in biomass, but mostly because the boreal species that are co-occurring uh, in, in these uh, very southern part of the, uh, the study area would have a very hard time to grow because it will be just too warm for them. So uh, the boreal species like basam fir, black spruce, all the spruce species, actually um, white birch that are still in the southern part of the, of the province, uh, will have very hard time to grow and they will be replaced at some point, but not completely by uh, co-occurring more thermophilus species like uh, maples, uh, beech species, or um, oak species also in the southern part of the, of the province. And actually the northward, we can, we can expect that uh, the, the migration of the, of the species, will, or we could say that the, the migration of the southern species will be able to compensate at some point for the loss of uh, boreal species at some point, but that's not exactly the case. So you have here uh, an example of red maple and black spruce. So red maple, everything that, that is in, uh, in green means that the biomass of this species will be higher than under a uh, baseline climate scenario by 2150. Uh, when it's uh, red, it means that there will be less uh, biomass. If it's uh, dark blue, it means that the species is able to colonize. And if it's dark uh, pink or pink, actually, um, it means that the species is extirpated from the, um, from the map. So you can see that red maple is having a good time actually under, under warming. That's one of the species that is actually most enjoying, I would say, uh, <laughs> climate change. Um, so, but uh, the, the dispersal or the migration of the species is constrained, uh, it's limited. So it, it cannot replace uh, at some point the, the boreal species that are decreasing a lot, uh, like black spruce, for example, just because there's too much fire um, or that the productivity of the species is just too low under uh, very warm conditions. So it means that there are some places within the, the commercial forests of Quebec that will be much more affected than others, even though most of the forests will be, uh, forest regions will be affected. Some are more affected than others and more quickly than others. Like the, the, the northwestern part of the boreal forest, you can see in, in green, uh, not green, but the yellow and orange. Uh, these, uh, well, the, the, the more orange or the more red, you see, it means that the, the, the landscape there, there are much more dissimilar to uh, the one under baseline climate. 
and you can see that the northwestern part of the uh, of the of the of the province is actually changing more rapidly and uh, more sustainably, I would say, and more severely um, under RCP 8.5, for example, and then other regions, uh, because there will be actually much more fire there, and there will be also constraint on, on growth of the species. So once we have identified those vulnerabilities to the forest, we can then identify the vulnerabilities to ecosystem goods and services that those forests are providing. And one pretty obvious uh, thing that uh, that could happen because fire will be much more prevalent prevalent in the um, in the landscape is the the impact on logging rates or the vulnerability of of the timber supply. So we'll see in, in the in the upcoming uh, slides. You have uh, we have well I, I have just um, put on the left side of the slides what is the vulnerability or the vulnerabilities that were uh, that are concern, um, of concern uh, for the, the, the given slide. And for this one, we, we considered fire as a, um, as, a as a vulnerability, sorry. It's like saying Fort Lauderdale very I mean, quickly five times. I'm, I'm just not able to do that. Anyway, so, we can see that uh, if there are more fires, it means that there will be much less wood that will be available to uh, for um, to to harvest. Uh, and because of that, we we have actually analyzed to which point uh, we could continue to uh, to harvest the landscape at the same rate that we are doing it today, but within the landscape actually that uh, within which there are much more fires and. If it's orange or red or even yellow at some point, uh, it means that when we are accumulating harvest rates and fire rates and fu future fire rates, it means that we are above the productive or the capacity of the forest to sustain all of those uh, disturbances that I've just talked about. So we can see that there's already by 2025 some regions that are appear appearing in orange or red. Uh, and actually, those regions are pretty much the same that were affected by fires last year, like the Level sur Kivion area, which is already appearing red. Uh, when it's red, actually, it means that uh, when we are accumulating fires and harvests, we are at 200% of the productive capacity of the forest. So that's a lot. Uh, and so it's not sustainable. And that's even worse under 2085. Um, uh, time period where almost all of the northwestern part of the, the, the province is under red color, so very extreme vulnerability. Um, other kind of vulnerabilities that will be affecting the, the forest is what we call the regeneration failures. Uh, these can be, uh, these well, these vulnerable, vulnerabilities, sorry, they are stemming from fire itself, so the increase in fire, but also harvesting. So when we have those regeneration failures is when a fire, for example, is occurring within a, a stem that is just too young to bear seeds, where uh, stems are not bearing seeds. For example, a fire that is occurring within a, a cut block that is 10 or 20 years old, uh, the black spruce uh, stems that are there, or jack pine, or anyway, they are just too young to, to lay their seeds after the fire just occurred. Uh, so if there are no mature stem within those, uh, those stems, it means that once the fire is occurring there, there's almost nothing left. So there's uh, no stocking or very low stocking, uh, very low regeneration. So, and these area can stay like that, like the, the picture that I just uh, showing you uh, on the right side of the slide. So you, you can stay like that for many, many years or even decades. And of course, if fire are going to be much more frequent and much larger, it means that the landscape will be much younger and those overlap between young patches and fire will be much more prevalent. And it means that the regeneration failure will be much more uh, frequent in the in the future, and these will be more frequent if the harvesting rates themselves are more frequent. Because harvesting also is also uh, um, uh, decreasing the the age of the of the landscape, offering more uh, regeneration uh, patches uh, 
in, in the landscape that can burn after that. So uh, we could see a lot more regeneration failure uh, under our CP 8.5, for example, and under very high um, harvesting rate by the end of the century. So when you have that, uh, it means that, oh, there's a, there's a mistake here, but anyway. Um, the, the, the forester in chief uh, in Quebec just led uh, an analysis to see to which point uh, those impacts of fire on regeneration failure, on the fact that we will not be able to conduct sustainable uh, forest management anymore in those uh, in those area, and how the, the impact of uh, climate change on productivity uh, will impact the actually the sustainability of the of the um, of timber supply. This is within an area that is uh, quite active in terms of, of fire. So it's uh, within the Lac Saint Jean, Saguenay Lac Saint Jean area. For those who are familiar, uh, in this this area under the current climate, we can expect to have uh, six million cubic meters of, of uh, timber supply in this area. Uh, but if we want to uh, to have sustainable uh, timber supply in this area, it means that we will have to lower the the timber supply to, to keep a very stable um, stable uh, timber supply because there will be much more regeneration failure. We will have less uh, mature and premature stands uh, because there will be much more fire, and we will have to lower to um, to decrease the timber supply by almost. 40, 50% under RCP 8.5 in this area to have stable uh, timber supply, and even almost 60% or more than 60% actually under RCP 8.5. And one thing also that we have to consider is the salvage, salvage logging. So you can see here, there's different colors in the, on the graph. Uh, the darker colors refer to the wood that is actually salvaged. So if there are more natural disturbances, there are more fires, it means that the, the proportion of the salvage will be much more important uh, under RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5 than under historical climate. And of course, the, there will be also vulnerabilities for uh, different uh, other goods and services, uh, good, uh, goods and ecosystem goods and services like caribou, for example. So uh, if there are more, so you probably know that Caribou is uh, associated with old growth coniferous forest or uh, open uh, lichen woodland, for example. Uh, if climate change has an impact on those uh, forest cover types, we could expect that it, this will also affect the habitat quality of the of caribou. And you have two example here for two different herds, one which is the Asinica herds and the other one, the Kopnaw. Uh, Asinica is within an area that is already burning quite a lot, but will be burning much more into the future, while the Cote Nord uh, won't, well, there's already uh, so, some fires, but not that much, and it won't increase a lot uh, in the future. Uh, and we can see how those the different cover types, forest cover types will change in the future according to the climate scenarios, but also according to the harvest uh, harvest scenarios. And of course, the more we harvest, the less old coniferous and mixed stems that we will have. But of course, uh, under um, very severe climate change, especially in regions that are affected by fire, there will be much more uh, forest cover type as that we are describing as natural disturbances that are just too young to be uh, uh, classified as as forest. So this this will hit this will have an impact on the the. The, the caribou uh, habitat quality. We could do also the same for bird species. Uh, for those who are familiar with, with bird species, you know, some of them are associated with old growth coniferous forests, mature clothes, and it's, uh, or mixed or hardwood or generous species. Of course, if uh, forest composition is changing, forest types are changing, the habitat of those bird species will, will also change. Some species will be favored by climate change, like generalist species. Uh, other species that are, for example, associated with old and mature coniferous forests will have a much harder time because those forest cover will be much rarer in the, in, in the landscapes. And we can see where are the winners and where are the losers in, the, in these kind of conditions. Uh, and we can also, uh, this is not show 
shown here, but we have also identified species that are much more uh, impacted by climate change and harvesting than, than others because of that. Uh, we can also expect to have uh, different uh, impacts also on the indigenous uh, society, uh, indigenous communities uh, that are living within those uh, those forest types that will be affected by by climate change. So, for example, we have conducted uh, analysis to see how um, trapping could be affected by change in forest composition. So there are different trap lines within the, uh, for example, the, the Picogan area in Northwestern Quebec and Jibugumu. Um, and we asked to expert from the communities how the changes in forest cover as we are expected could change the, the way that they are, uh, or the, 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 probab the probability actually that they will be able to trap Martin, for example. And we know that Martin is, closely associated with uh, closed uh, coniferous um, boreal forests. So uh, according to the results, uh, according to the expert, uh, we have, uh, I, actually I'm saying we, but that's, that's, <laughs> that's Annie Claude Delille that uh, has uh, conducted those analysis uh, for the regional distributed assessment. And you can see how the, the, the probability of being able to trap Martin could be different according to uh, to time and according to uh, the different climate change scenario and different forestry scenario. Um, and you can see that for most uh, of the for most for most expert, uh, forestry actually has a much larger impact than climate change. And uh, and about half of them say that they will still be able to trap Martin uh, all along the the chrono sequence. But if they are saying that they are able to adapt to the different uh, to the different changes, this probability is actually increasing a lot. So adaptations offer some flexibility for maintaining the landscape value in this area. Uh, same for carbon, actually. So uh, we know that carbon budget will be affected by by climate change because the forests will change. the the, the wood product that we will have from the, uh, that can store carbon actually, that we will have from this forest will change. Uh, the composition rate will change. Um, the growth of the, of the forest will also change. So when we are considering all of this, uh, we have conducted a, a study uh, within the Mesquinonger area in the Southern, well, yeah, it's quite Southern, Southwestern um, Quebec uh, province. And we know that with, increasing climate change so that's the uh, what you see on the on the lower side of the of, of the graph there could be more emission from um, from carbon well from the forest and carbon uh, and, and forest product actually than under um, a baseline scenario so carbon will also be the carbon budget will also be affected Now, so we are now at the at the last step of our framework. So, what are the different adaptation strategies that we can adapt that we can adopt to uh, according to those different vulnerabilities that we have uh, identified earlier? Uh, we can classify those different adaptation options uh, depending on the the way that we are promoting or not change within the changes within the forest. Or we want to uh, on the on the on the axis, and the other axis is uh, according to the the fact that we have to reduce the impact of climate change, or we have to or we want to to uh, to facilitate uh, an adaptive response to uh, to the forest to these change, and we can actually classify those um, those different adaptation strategies as either resistance, where we are maintaining conditions through time. Or resiliency, where we are tolerate, tolerating some change, where we want to uh, to go back to initial conditions or to something that is actually uh, still uh, fulfilling the, um, the 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 objective that we had before, or we are just transitioning to uh, so there there are climate change, severe climate change, for example. We know that the species there are not adapted anymore to uh, to the the future climate, so we're just changing the forest to be able to. Uh, uh, so we are transitioning toward a forest that is much more adapted to the future conditions. 
And we can also classify those, um, those uh, strategies according to a gradient of management strategies. So there could be resistance, resilience, and transition strategies that are uh, either that could that could be uh, realized through conservation, through reductions of our management intensity to business as usual, mixed or intens intensification of the of the management strategy. So I will just present you both of the different classification uh, and different different examples of those um, uh, of adaptation strategies that we can adapt that we can adopt actually to uh, to uh, respond to the vulnerabilities that we have uh, identified earlier. So, for example, uh, the, when I, I just talked to you about the, the fact that within the Lac Saint Jean Saguenay, uh, Saguenay Lac Saint Jean area, because of climate change, because of the the increase in fire, we would see uh, a decrease in harvested wool volumes in this area. Uh, there are different uh, strategies that we can adopt to uh, to to be to be resilient to those. Uh, to these conditions, and this could go through intensification of the of the forest. For example, if we are planting uh, actively planting after uh, the disturbance or after cutting uh, in this in this area, and especially if we are theoretically planting more deciduous species, we could mitigate the the loss in in the harvest uh, wood volume. Why? Because some species of deciduous trees are able to grow better under future climate. And especially, they could actually reduce the impact of climate change on fire because deciduous species, it's not the panacea, of course, but they are less flammable than, than conifer species. So if the, the landscape is becoming more deciduous at some point, it will be also less flammable. So it means that we could mitigate at some point the impact of climate change on fire and on the uh, decrease in harvested wool volume. So this is an example. Uh, we could also have uh, different mixed strategies or intensification strategies uh, to uh, bring resilience uh, and at some point transition to uh, to the forest landscape, like uh, to, to avoid actually uh, regeneration failures. So if you remember before, uh, regeneration failures were occurring uh, because the stand that burned were just too young to, uh, to, to regenerate. So there are different strategies that can be adopted to, uh, to uh, mitigate this, like, as I, as I mentioned before, planting. Uh, so we could plant, we could plant some species that are much more able to grow, to grow fast like jack pine, for example. Um, but we could also uh, build, we could also build roads to go there because planting necessitate roads to go there um, and more roads to, to get access to, uh, to areas that have burned that may not be within reach uh, if uh, according to the current road network. Uh, we could also use what we call uh, a more resilient strategy, which is the variable retention. So imagine that uh, you have a uh, harvesting uh, a cut block where instead of removing all the the, the mature stand, you're leaving there five, ten, or fifteen percent of the mature stands there, uh, mature stems there. So it means that if a fire is to occur within this uh, this area, there will still be some stems that could uh, seed the um, the area after the fire to avoid uh, regeneration failure. So we have uh, analyzed a different kind of, uh, of the, these different kind of strategies to see what could be the impact of climate change on the on the, on the wood volume that could be uh, merchantable in the future. And under our CPN point five, we can see that uh, strategies that is actually intensive uh, intensification. So we are building roads uh, to access to access the area. We are planting jack pine. Uh, we have also some some uh, retention strategies we could mitigate the impact of the climate change by a lot uh, relative to mixed strategies or business as usual strategies. But of course, these strategies can be very costly. And when we are considering the costs of those strategies, uh, so the cost of road building, for example, the cost of plantation, scarification and stuff like that. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, planting a an actor, one actor of a, of forests uh, in the in the boreal forest in in Quebec right now is about 
five thousand to six thousand dollars per hectare. So that's that's quite a lot. So that's very very costly, and we are not talking about low building there. So when we are putting everything together, so the revenues from wood that we are harvesting minus the costs of the plantation and roll building. Actually, that's the business as usual strategy that is still um, more, uh, that is less costly, that the more costly is the intensification strategies. And we are in the red actually when we are uh, uh, doing an intensification strategy. So that there's, we have to, to think about uh, the the cost, the profit, or the cost of the strategies that we are implementing, uh, even though uh, at the end we could have more woods, it could cost a lot more. Uh, in terms of carbon, so uh, we could adapt different strategies to to see what could be the, the impact of harvesting and climate change on the carbon budgets. And actually, it really depends. Uh, we we have conducted uh, simulation strategies within the Forêt Montmorency area to see if conservation or reduction of the harvest uh, intense harvesting intensity uh, was best to uh, to store carbon uh, relative to int intensification strategies, and it ended up that under a climate change scenario, if we are to reduce the harvesting. Um, Harvesting, strategy, uh, harvesting rates, we could store more carbon within the forest and then avoid carbon emission uh, in, the, in the atmosphere uh, when we are comparing with strategies that are actually intensifying the, uh, uh, the harvesting, uh, uh, harvesting rates. This is good for the Forêt Montmorency, so within the boreal forest. I'm not showing it right now here, but uh, uh, I can give you the results. We have conducted the same uh, analysis, but within the southern uh, forest, within the northern hardwood, and the results were just completely the opposite. So it means that if we are considering carbon emission, uh, we the, the region itself where we are conducting those uh, those different strategies are, uh, I mean, it's it's really important to to know that. Uh, in terms of conservation, uh, for example, the, on the caribou side, we know that uh, if uh, we, we have assessed different strategies, so conservation strategies, intensification strategies, and it ends up that full protection uh, strategies, of course, theoretically, could lead to uh, even better conditions by the, the end of the century right now, uh, even if it's under very severe uh, climate scenarios, we could end up in 2100 by better habitat quality in blue uh, than, than what we have today. If we were to preserve old uh, coniferous forests uh, and if we were to decommission some, some roads, um, even if fire is, is, is increasing, even if the, the productivity of forests is, is different. So these the conservation strategy here could be could be much better. So we can see that it, it really depends on what you want to consider uh, what what is best to uh, as a as an adaptation strategy. So uh, in a nutshell, so you see that the regional analysis that we are that we have conducted are uh, they were really important to identify the vulnerabilities uh, to the, the forest and the right adaptation strategies also for the for the area. Uh, we know that it means that if we are to, if we want to have a holistic view of the adaptation strategies, we have to have a lot of collaboration within a different level uh, from the different stakeholders. Um, of course, it's very important to communicate the results and for uh, knowledge transfer also. That's what we are conducting today and that's what we have conducted before, especially within uh, using the, uh, the webinars. Uh, you uh, you saw that actually the impacts of climate change will be very different from the region to another and will affect the forestry sector at, as a whole. Um, so it means that the, the business as usual strategy that we have currently is, well, it's, it's, it's certainly not a panacea and we have to review those, uh, those approaches. Uh, we have to uh, to review them actually right now because uh, what we are doing right now will have an impact uh, in few decades. Uh, and so we have to, to consider the inertia of the systems for sure. 
And as I as mentioned before, uh, since the, the vulnerabilities are different from a region to another, since the, the impact of a given strategy is actually different uh, from a region to another, we, we cannot have wall-to-wall -wall strategies. These should be, should be avoided. And just to uh, finish with that, uh, so it really depends on the, the, um, the good and, uh, and ecosystem uh, services that you want to, uh, to, to look at, but resilience strategy can be good at some point. In another part, it could be intensification for another one, it could be conservation. So it really, uh, it really depends. Uh, so that's pretty much why you you have to uh, to analyze uh, multiple value at a time. Uh, sometimes you can reach no regret solution also. So it means that um, if we are conducting some kind of a of a of a strategy, uh, it could be good whatever the climate scenario that will happen, whatever the 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 ecosystem good and services that you are looking at. But one thing for sure, we will require much more resources, financial and um, working resources to uh, to implement those uh, those strategies at, at a large scale. Well, thanks a lot. And if you have questions, I'm ready to answer them. Thanks, Jan. That was fantastic. Very informative. Uh, a little scary. <laughs> Some of those impacts are, are quite alarming. Um, so obviously really important work. Uh, we do have um, about uh, eight minutes or so to um, answer questions. So if you do have any, you're welcome to enter them into the chat box. We are a smaller group today, so if you prefer as well, we can um, you can ask your question using your microphone. Uh, please do just raise your hand, and then I can unmute your your microphone for you. Do it that way. Uh, wondering if anybody would like to like to start us off. I think there's there's one question in the chat box that I can answer readily uh, if you want. Oh, there we go. Yes, it is. So there was oh, that's one question from, from Jade uh, okay, yeah. saying that if our uh, simulations or analysis were considering non-climate induced invasive species like oak wilt and beech leaf disease, uh, nope, <laughs> they, they, were, they were not considering those uh, those disease. Actually, we, we didn't even consider uh, for beech uh, the uh, beech bark disease. So yes, it could have create impact on future landscapes. Uh, that's actually something that we are currently looking at. So what could be the impact of those uh, exotic species on, on forest landscapes? Some work has already been done by uh, Christian Messier uh, and his team, like uh, with uh, Marco Mina and uh, Noria Quidoué. They have conducted uh, those analysis on, on the southern part of the, the Quebec province, and they are showing that uh, some some of those uh, disease agents could could be could have a great impact uh, on their climate change uh, in in the in the northern hardwood forest, for example. So yeah, we, we have to, uh, to consider them at some point. Thanks for the question, Jade. Uh, we do have a chat box question from Carolyn, and then I'll get to you, Mike. Uh, you mentioned Quebec undertaking a strategic review on these topics. Do you have more details on what they're doing, when it will be released, and so forth? Well, there's already an uh, adaptation strategy that was uh, adaptation to climate change strategies that was released. Uh, this is kind of reviewed at some point because currently, because of the 2023 forest fire that we had, there's there are what we call uh, table de réflexion uh, pour l'avenir de la forêt. So, uh, the future future forest uh, what will happen um and there are currently discussion around around that um and the different stakeholders are involved in those kind of things but for sure the the status quo is certainly not uh something that we wish to to have in the upcoming decades uh one thing that is really important though is that uh, there are already other strategies that are on the on the table that are yet to be published, like uh, strategies for caribou. Uh, there's also the strategies for wood production that was published a few years ago. But these, well, especially the, the strategy for wood production is 
well, that will be very difficult to, to reach the objective of this strategy, given the impact of climate change that, that will occur in the upcoming decades. And actually, even the 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 department, the ministry itself said that it won't be able to uh, to reach those objectives. Uh, it said he said that a um, few weeks ago, a few days ago. Uh, so all of those strategies have some point to consider the impact of climate change uh, in them, because otherwise some objective will be very, very different, very difficult to uh, to reach. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Uh, OK, Mike, go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Great presentation, Jan. Um, question for you about uh, the modeling work in relation to uh, like transitions of, of species compositions. Um, I understand that, you know, when you get those disturbance events, they, they can happen quite quickly. But how did you deal with it in your models about those sort of slower transitions as, you know, mature forests can maybe withstand some of those temperature changes over time and maybe a slower progression? Yeah, yeah that, that's a good question. And actually, our simulation analysis, uh, they are conducted dynamically. So they are considering the impact of natural disturbances, but also the, the competition between trees that uh, that could occur. Uh, so this competition means that if there's there's no disturbance or very, I mean, low severity disturbances, there's much more inertia in the system. Uh, so it means that the transition will occur much slower than within the landscape that will be affected by more natural disturbances like, for example, the boreal forest. So yes, we have to uh, to to, uh, to take into account those kind of things. One thing that we are not taking into account that could have uh, an impact on the, the, the speed at which um, forest communities can change is the adaptation, I mean, genetic or phenotypic uh, uh, adaptation of the trees. Uh, these can be different from if we are talking about regeneration or growth of the species. And this could have an impact on the way uh, the, the, the ecosystem will transition in, in the future. And there are currently some, some work in, in, this, uh, in this branch, I would say. No pun intended here, but uh, um, with uh, Martin Martin Girardin and uh, Nathalie Isabel who are conducting those kind of uh, of research here. Okay, thanks. And then second question: I was wondering when you can move to Alberta to uh, help us uh, do such an analysis. <laughs> ah, well, that could be great. Actually, we have some some stuff. Uh, we have done some stuff there uh, in the Alpac area, so uh, the Fort McMurray area. Uh, so yeah, it's not it's not province-wide uh, there's already some some folks from cfs that are working uh, in this area also uh i can send you the some papers there uh it's, it's mostly about restoration of uh, uh of oil sands there uh, under climate change but it could be i mean the what we are finding there could be applied at some point to much of the boreal forest uh, in, in alberta for sure okay thanks jan Thanks. Thanks, Mike, for your questions. Uh, okay, let's jump to Jade. Uh, given the demonstrated change in carbon storage, is Enercan working with ECCC to set some standards on carbon credits for planting forest conservation? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not knowledgeable in those kind of things. Uh, but for sure, one thing that we that we can say is that the the species that we will plant and the, the 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 site in which we will plant this species will have a great impact on what we'll be considering as a carbon source or a carbon sink if it, the, the, the plantation will be a carbon source or a carbon sink so given the fact that we know that natural disturbances for example will be much uh much more severe in the boreal forest for example so Maybe that plantation could be best uh, in the southern part of the of the of the forest, just just as an example, for example, uh, or using some some species that are uh, less prone or less vulnerable to uh, to drought or to warming conditions. So th these are the stuff that we have to to look at when we are considering carbon in those kind of plantations, like with the two billion tree program, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then 
Um, logging permits are typically managed provincially. Are you working with the province to advise on changes to current practices? Yeah, yeah, we're working with them. Uh, we're working actually with so the, the work that I just presented here uh, with the the BFEC, which is the Bureau de Forestier Chef, so the the Forester in Chief. So we are uh, greatly collaborating with them. We are also collaborating with uh, the the DRF, which is the Direction de la Recherche Forestière, so the Forest Research uh, Direction. Well, I don't know. Um, and yeah, so so we are working with a lot of them. There's already quite a lot of, uh, of funds available from the, from the province to uh, to do these kind of research. We are conducting collabor collaboratively. And actually, we could have not conducted these kind of research without, of course, the province or the regions or the different stakeholders that are uh, important in these, uh, in these kind of things, yeah. Okay, thanks. A uh, question from Matt, any plans for working with regional higher resolution model projections to see how it may impact results? Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, we are actually currently looking at uh, higher resolution. Well, we will look at higher resolution results from the CRCM6 model, uh, mostly for fires. Um, for forest composition, This it's not yet, uh, we will, well, it, it's not, I don't think we will look at this in the uh, very soon, but for fire, yeah, we are uh, currently planning to produce a uh, projections for fire, whether and this is at a very fine resolution, maybe 2.5 kilometer resolution using the CRCM6 driven by the HRDPS for those that, that are familiar with them. Um, so, uh, yeah, th this is something on our, on our plate because, you know, for fire, for example, this kind of, uh, of final resolution is really important because we could be at the convective, uh, scale. So it means that we are able to simulate thunderstorms and stuff. So where the lightnings are occurring, so where fires could also occur. So these are the things that we wish to, uh, to study in the, the upcoming years. Excellent. Okay, any uh, last second, last call for questions? Okay, thanks uh, for hanging out a little bit after the hour here. Uh, thank you so much, Jan, for your presentation. It was excellent. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Like I said, I'll be in touch with some uh, post-event webinar event uh, resources. And um, that's it. Anything, any last remarks there, Jan? Uh, well, thanks for attending. And uh, even though the it looks pretty harsh in the future, there are solutions. So uh, <laughs> love it. <laughs> yeah. That's great. OK, great. OK, have a great day, everybody. And uh, we'll you at the next event. Thanks so much. See you, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Suzanne.